So we're starting a new um, series, and family dedication is a great example of exactly how the Word of God works in our life. It's a word of affirmation, acceptance, and identity. The words that were spoken, uh, Pastor Kim actually goes through a, a, the whole week or a couple of weeks to make sure she gets a right word for each child, a prophetic word that they can actually, they can actually use to kind of direct the path of that child. And I think it's really important. Um, you know, I don't know, growing up, we were, my brother and I were a year apart, and my family, this small little town, you know, small town, everybody knows everything about your life. And we were the Juarez's, and, uh, you know, I had cousins and aunts and uncles thinking that Raul and I would wind up being in the penitentiary. <laughs> we, were always, we were always getting into stuff. I mean, we didn't know that, you know, you couldn't do certain things, so we just took, took stuff all the time. And an expectation, and to create an expectation in your family of what is good actually sets a course for that child and your family. And it's sometimes really important that we can break a cycle in all of our family dynamics, you know, where the Smiths, they're just angry all the time, and the, the Joneses, they're always so, you know, and you can actually break that and say, no, this family will be established on the Word of God, and we walk in righteousness. And these things we break, the best of this we take, but the stuff that we don't want in our lives, we can actually make a decision to, make, to break that, that tie to a lot of natural things. So that's why it's so beautiful that when we dedicate families, we're saying you have a choice to do something great in God. And it's exactly the way the Father looked at us. Jesus lived a life defined by God's word. And we're going to talk about in this world, but not of it. What, where do we go to find truth? Well, Jesus lived a life defined by God's word. He didn't fall to the temptation of being redefined by culture, emotion, government, or dead religion. And we make that choice every day. Are we going to be influenced by culture, by religion, by all, all the stuff that coming against us are trying to influence, influence, influence you to build something different? And we build our life. We have to build our life on something. And don't be, don't, don't be ignorant of this fact. Whatever you watch on TV, whatever you watch at, at all, Whatever you experience, there is an agenda being purported against you, and it's usually against God. So you have to understand every show you watch, everything you do, there's a thing of, there's an underlying agenda to take your eyes off of a righteous life, living in righteousness. And there's a driver right now, especially right now in the last, you know, uh, 10, 15 years. It's amazing to me that we are probably at the pinnacle of society's ability to find truth, to find, uh, who would have known that on your phone you can swipe and find everything in the world you'd ever want to know? There's information upon information. The most brilliant uh, people on the planet probably exist right now. And yet, right now, one of the biggest struggles that people have is knowing who they are. At the, the, in the times of, of all, all this great enlightenment, we have people not knowing who they are and identifying with something lesser than who they are. They're identifying with creation instead of the creator. And it's, it's just an interesting place. So the need to be accepted in this is the driver. The need to be accepted is the driver in most controversial discussions in our culture of lost purpose and identity. There's still this driver that's, that's affecting every aspect of life. What do I identify? What is my identity? And we are designed by God for the holy, and we settle for stuff of the flesh, of this world. We're designed for purpose and direction and eternity, and we get caught up with all natural, limited stuff that we face in a vapor of time world. And we're distracted because we don't know who we are. So what's the first thing? I love the way God thinks. The first thing he did with Jesus was affirmation. An affirming word. And y'all, humanity is looking for affirmation somewhere, to be affirmed, to be, to be identified as I'm, in, I'm okay. Had a great conversation just recently with a, a brother who's, who, uh, who didn't know. He had, you know, 30, 30 50, something, it might have been 50 years ago, he had an indiscretion, he had an affair, and um, didn't know it. Didn't know that there was a, not that he didn't know he had an affair, he knew he had an affair. But... <laughs> No, he definitely knew he had that. But what he didn't know was that a, a, a son was born from that affair. 
and the the wife, the woman never told him. So 50 years goes by. He gets a, a knock on his door. Say, listen, I just want to. I'm I'm from. And and the the brother, this friend of mine said, if I would have known, and the the only thing the son wanted to hear, this child wanted to hear was, did you not want me? The driver of his life for all these many years. And the, the, the woman wouldn't tell him about this individual. He kept him completely. And then somehow through a, as a matter of fact, through a DNA thing, you know, uh, I-23, whatever that is, you know, you find your DNA. They found this connection. Who is this guy? And, they, and this guy shows up and says, I just want to know, did you ever want me? There's this desire in every human to be affirmed by a father, to be connected at this incredible reunion of life after so many years. Isn't that amazing what love can do? what affirmation can do. And this restoration of relationship, even though it's in its latter days, thank the Lord, this man has a whole other family now that he can be a grandpa to and a father to that he never knew. But there was a child crying out, did my father ever want me? And I think in all honesty, society is crying out, is there a father up there somewhere that wants me? Identity and affirmation are so closely related. God, in all his wisdom, pronounced an acceptance of his son before he would be tempted to try and earn it. Now, you have to have this perspective. You have to understand, Jesus was all God, but he was also all man. He was a man. And so, as a man, I believe he needed to hear from Father. As a man, like we all, humanity needs to hear from Father. And because God knew that affirmation was so vitally important to all of us. In Matthew 3, 16, it says, when he was being baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water and behold, the heavens were open to him. And this is really important. God, Jesus, the man, the son of man, look what it says. And he saw the spirit of God descending like a dove. Now the spirit was in him. He was a, he was a son of God, no, never separated. But as a man, if he needed to see something in the natural to come down and say, the son of man is accepted. And he saw and God met him at his need to see. Love's an empty word. It has to be seen, y'all. And he saw the spirit of God descending like a dove and it, uh, it lighted upon him. Verse 17, and suddenly a voice came from heaven and he heard, this is what he heard. He saw and he heard this word that would keep him for the rest of his life as the son of man. Not the son of God, the son of man needed to hear this. This is what he heard. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. If Jesus was tempted in every way, in Hebrews 2, 17 and 18 and 4, 15, it says that Jesus was tempted in every way, then Satan's greatest strategy of questioning identity had to be addressed. Identity had to be addressed. How did Adam and Eve fall? The devil said, did God say? Causing a doubt of who God really was. Well, you know that he, God's, kind of worried that you'll, you'll be like him. Trying to distract them from the relationship with their father by a lie and challenging identity. Do you know who you are? There's a mandate in this church that I've told the children's pastor, I've told the youth pastor, and I've told us old pastors as well. We have to make sure that at three years of age, when a child gets tempted by the devil on identity, he knows who he is. She knows who she is. That at 13, when they get challenged with identity, that they know who they are. At 33, when you get challenged with identity, you know how to respond. I know what God has said that I am. I am not dictated by my past. I'm not held back by, by whatever someone stated. I know what God has said. And if I had a terrible situation growing up, I never heard an affirming word from any man, any woman. I know what God has said. 
We need this affirming word as well. We need to hear from the Father. This is my beloved son. This is my beloved daughter in who I am well pleased. Affirmation establishes identity. Galatians 4, 6, because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Not great Jehovah, not King of kings, not Lord of lords, but there's a spirit that God laid into your heart that cries out, Daddy, God. Remember all these kids that were here, all these little kids, and the ones that eventually will talk? <laughs> and they're going to say, Mommy and Daddy, eventually, and when you hear this child, when, remember when the first time you heard, and, and you and your wife got into a fight of who, who was, who, what he said first, or what she said, he, you know, she said, Mommy, or she said that, when you hear this child reach out to you and say, Dada, and you go, what? We're talking. He knows who I am. That's the spirit that God laid into our hearts. That we would look up and go, Dada. And he would go, we're having communication. Hey, buddy, how you doing? Y'all, that's the spirit that we have with God. It's not, now, Lord, far away from me, hallelujah. It's not like that. It's Abba. That's the relationship you have with Father. Verse 7, therefore, you are no longer, you are no longer slaves, but a son, and if a son, then an heir through God. You're not a servant. You're not a slave. You're not the guy in the back that God goes, oh, is he coming? Did Orlando walk in the room? Please don't look at him. He, let's not, don't make eye contact. Orlando's got, no, God is, is looking for you. And when you cry, Abba, he goes, hold up, my son and my daughter, they're calling my name. Abba, we are heirs. So when you understand the affirmation of Father, God, Creator, looking down and calling you, my son, my daughter, my heir. It changes everything on who you are. John 1.12 says, But to all who believed in him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. They are reborn, not with a physical birth resulting from human passion or plan, but a birth that comes from God. You've been born again. You are a child of God. You are an heir. Not the lost. You are found and he's looking at you and says, and says, I love you. And even though our heart would question, and the devil would want you to question, he doesn't love you. You've done so much bad. It's your bad performance that he's looking at. You, you can't even approach him. And God is going, please come to me. It would have been enough to be a slave or a servant of God, but we are heirs of righteousness. Thank you. Isn't that awesome, church? I, I know it doesn't, it doesn't like, when you say I'm an heir of righteousness, you kind of go, well, I kind of know me. Let, me. let me explain to you why that's not really, I mean, because I know I, I, you know, I kicked the cat yesterday and, you know, I, I cut somebody off and that was driving. But I prayed for him as I kind of went. When God says, and you got to remember, when God spoke, when God spoke, nothing became something, right? And God spoke and there was. God has spoken. You are my heir. Don't argue with it. Just go, thank you. Just don't get it, but okay. And the creation of that thing will come alive in you as you embrace your right to be an heir of God. That's who you are. So, so let's say you got that down. Let's say, okay, God, I thank you. I'm an heir. Praise God. It's wonderful. Thank you. I'm going to keep saying it. Pastor Lonzo, I keep saying it. God, I keep saying it. I'm enjoying it. Just understand this. <laughs> when you finally come to some understanding, some revelation, and you go, man, praise the God, I, I praise God, I'm an heir. The devil goes, oh. So this is exactly what happened. So the proclamation at the end of chapter three in Matthew, 
my son, and whom well pleased, chapter 4, verse 3. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be a son of God, command these stalls to be made bread. The very proclamation, you're my son, I'm well pleased, high five, let's go home, it's wonderful. The devil comes and says, did God say? Are you really, in other words, he's saying, do you really know who you are? Do you really believe you know who you are? And let me, let me see if I can create a doubt. Now look at the process here. If thou be a son, a, a son then turn the stones into bread. In other words, you're hungry and uh, satisfy your appetite. If you're really who you are, satisfy these appetites to prove that you are. And most of them would go, well, well, of course I am. Sure, sure, sure I'm a son. I'm going to go prove it. And if you have to prove it, then you didn't really believe it. See, it used to be, it used to be you're innocent unless you're proven guilty. Now, you're guilty and you've got to prove your innocence. I mean, anyone can accuse you of anything nowadays. But truly, if you know who you are, then you don't have to prove anything. Why get caught up with an argument? The enemy wants you to get caught up with an argument and perform. I know who I am. Do you know who you are? Then prove it. Verse 4, I love what Jesus did. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And he quotes Deuteronomy 8.3. Man shall not live by bread alone. In other words, you cannot live. And by this is really important. Remember, you are a person of spirit. You're a spirit. You were, you were a spirit from the beginning. And yes, sin came into the world, but you're still a person of spirit. You have, you're going to live eternity somewhere. Nothing in this world can satisfy, natural things will not satisfy spiritual longing. The only connection, the connection you really want is to God. But you can try different things in this world and it's going to leave you empty. I'm just, it's just going to leave you empty. Has anyone ever experienced that? I, you know, where you were pursuing, pers if I can only get this, I'll be really happy. And you got that and you went, that's it. But to be connected to your father and savior, that means the rest of it can work out any way it needs to because I know I'm connected to him. And so here, here's how he addressed Satan's greatest strategy and how God's greatest gift. He says here, Satan's greatest lie, perform and earn your right to belong. That's his greatest lie. Perform, do all the right stuff and earn your right to belong. Jesus' greatest gift, I know I belong, I don't need to perform. I don't got to prove anything to anybody. I know what God has said. Well, then prove it. Nah, I don't think so. I know. What do you think, church? Isn't that wonderful? And he also used the word, which is who he is. Jesus is the word. He didn't, and he didn't reach in the attack from the enemy. He didn't reach for good psychology or, no, he reached for the word of God. Now, this is really important, y'all, and this is about us today. Jesus, the son of man, not the son of God, Jesus, the son of man. Remember, he's human. Responded by the word of God. What does that mean? The son of man had to read God's word. The son of God is the word, but the son of man had to go read God's word. As a matter of fact, it's tradition in the Jewish faith to memorize the first five books of the Bible. They had res he had resource. He had, but Jesus, the Son of Man, had to read it. Yes? Come on, church. Yes? All right? And, and out of that, he had to choose the right word for the right moment. Do you think Jesus just kind of was walking around and he thought, when well, the enemy came to him, he said, I already got my script. I know what he's going to ask. Now, the Son of God knew everything, but the Son of Man had to go through the process, and if he took any shortcuts, then we couldn't uh, enjoy his righteousness in us. He had to achieve victory as a man, which meant he had to read it, he had to retain it, 
And then when the attack came, he had to, this is the word I'll use. Right, church? We live by the same process. I don't live by feelings, emotions, or circumstances. I don't live by the dictates of dead religion, culture, or government. I live by the word of God. The word of God is alive, and it's, it every, it's, it's ever-changing. And, I, and you, you know this, church. Remember what, when, when you would come across a scripture, and, and it was cool, and you, and you just read it, and you read it about a thousand times, and all of a sudden, one day, you open up and you read it, and it just kind of comes alive like you've never seen it before in your life. Like, where did this come from? It's the Holy Spirit revealing that it's alive. The word of God is alive and breathing, and, and it reveals itself to you when you're ready to see it. And the Holy Spirit will help you reveal the word of God, but the word of God is alive. And at the moment of your need, what you've been reading, what you've been feeding on, the Holy Spirit will bring to remembrance, and it's amazing. Every one of us has experienced, I don't know what to say, and then all of a sudden the word of God could fix it and you state the right thing. This is what Jesus experienced. Satan's attack was faced by a man grounded and affirmed in God's word, setting in motion how we should handle the trials of life and the attacks of Satan. So if you never read the Bible, if you never study old, new, whatever, if you never get into a groove, then your resources are your experience and what you feel. But when you have the word of God in you, it trumps emotion, circumstance, and you stand on his word. And whatever you see and whatever has been said, you're not worried anymore because I'm standing on his word. If tomorrow you get the worst news possible, you go, thank you, doctor, I appreciate it. Now I stand on his word. Good thing, church. Jesus quoted Deuteronomy 8.3, man shall not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Okay, so that's good. But if you look at the whole chapter, the whole chapter, verse one starts off with this, that you may live and increase and go in and take possession of the land which the Lord swore to give to your forefathers. Following his word has a promise of, of wealth, protection, provision, following his word. This is the, this is the chapter, this is the, the, the chapter that Jesus referenced in combating the enemy. I live by the word of God. But in the chapter, it talks about abundance, provision, and verses four through nine explain an amazing blessed life. Amazingly blessed. In other words, well, it depends if you think, okay, so here's the thing. They're there 40 years and their clothes never wore out. Now that could be a drag for some of y'all, I know, but. And their shoes never wore, it says something about their feet. And then and if you look at the, the, the context in Hebrew, it actually implies they never got a callus. Wow. 40 years in sand and they never got. So God protected them and, and the blessings are amazing of just following his word. If you look at the chapter, it's the results of knowing who you are and the results of knowing who God is in you and knowing his word is to be blessed. That even your feet are blessed. The consequences of forgetting who you are, you'll find in the same chapter, verse 11 through 17, there's consequences of forgetting who you are and forgetting who God is in you. Then verse 18 says, so remember, it says these are the consequences. Verse 18 says, so stop and remember, remember who you belong to. And verses 19 and 20 says, it will be better if you remember and don't forget. So living by God's word, and I want you to see something about this so cool. Man shall not live by bread alone. And what he, what he states in chapter 8 are blessings that we think we have to pursue when in actuality it's a benefit of following his word. The things of life, you think I've got to pursue them, but if I, chapter 8 of Deuteronomy says, if I follow God's word, these are the expressions of God's blessing upon your life. It's not that he doesn't want you to have the stuff of this world, just don't make it the stuff. Don't make the stuff the stuff. Don't make it the focal point. Man shall not live by bread alone, but when you follow the word of God, all these things are a blessing to you. Well, praise God. 
Let's follow the word of God. What do you think, church? So, Jesus, it says in first, um, John, chapter, uh, Gospel of John, that he is the word. So, and, and so let's, I want to make sure you understand out of everything I'm saying, Deuteronomy 8 shows how important the word of God is. It's bread that gives life. Jesus is life. If you could put that, kick that button on. Oh, it's, oh I just smell it. Nothing. John 6, 35, Jesus replied, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry again. Whoever believes in me will never thirst. Make no distinction. Make, make sure you understand. When you see bread, it implies life. He's life to you. And he was saying, man shall live by the life of this world alone. The things that you need, I understand you need them, but you're not going to live with focus on the things, but you focus on my word and live by my word, all these things will be added. Y'all with me? So he is the bread of life and will never thirst. In Matthew 6, 33, seek the kingdom of God above all else and, give, give, and live righteously. So how do we live righteously? By seeking first the kingdom. What is the kingdom? Jesus is the kingdom. What is Jesus? The bread of life. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and he will give you everything you need. So don't worry about tomorrow for tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today, trouble is enough for today. Today's trouble is enough for today. So keep your eyes on Jesus. Read his word. It brings life to you. And what you're pouring into your life is stuff you'll need tomorrow. As you're walking out life, in life, normal life, you're going to confront something and it's going to challenge you. And you're going to have to have something deeper than your own intellect to rely upon. Now, nothing wrong with your intellect. I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure you're pretty smart. But the attack needs to be made by the word of God. The attack needs to be responded to by the word of God. So we see first the kingdom, 1 Peter 2, 9. This is your identity. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of the darkness into his wonderful light. Do you know who you are? Do you know who you are? And this is where we get to several, uh, you know, back, back when I was a kid, religion, I was, I was involved in a domination that, that kind of promoted poverty equates to holiness and, and being humble. So when someone said, uh, you did really well at that song or play or whatever, you did really well. You go, oh, it's not me. I'm just an old worm for Jesus. Well, of course it was you. So let me give you a clue. Whenever you do something well and someone says, you did really well, I say, thank you, praise God. And then give all the glory to Jesus. But there's this weird thing that somehow debasing ourselves equates to holiness. You are a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation. Out of a darkness to his marvelous light. This is who you are. And you walk by his word and you live by his word. And therefore, I will not thirst or be hungry by any other thing. I just live by him. What do you think, church? The verse that Jesus quoted out of Deuteronomy 8 was made available to him by the Spirit. So when in the, the attack of the enemy, the verse that he went to, he didn't have it locked away someplace. It was revealed to him by the Spirit. Because the Son of Man had to read it. He read it as a son of man and then used it. The word he used settled the attack from Satan on identity and showed the provision, that provision, prosperity, protection are available in God's word. So therefore, everyone say God's word is important. Man, I'm so glad that you agree with me on that one. So therefore, this is our homework. Because we're changing, we're going to flip the script. The whole month is about we're in it, but we're not of it. And, and, and this right here is the culmination of harvest. A seed was planted. A plant grew. We looked upon the field and it was beautiful. Someone had to cut it. Someone had to get the seed out of the whatever, had to develop it, and either sold the seed for replanting or made this. And this is who we are. 
We are bread for people. And what, how we live by the word of God brings life to people. So you have to have the word of God in you. So this is your homework for the week. Y'all ready? I want you to read and I want us as a body to read the book of Matthew and the book of Galatians in the Bible. The book of Matthew and the book of Galatians. By the way, everyone can, uh, ushers, you can go start passing out that bread, if you will, now. Now, the book of Matthew bridges the gap from Old Testament to New Testament. It makes uh, more references to the Old Testament than any other gospel. It shows how Jesus fulfills the prophecy made about him, and it focuses on Jesus being the Messiah. So I know chapter one will be difficult. The begatting thing is really long. But I want us to get into um, a habit. And by the way, right now we're passing out bread. This is going to be for communion today. Take, take a little package. And this is what we'll use for communion as a touch point, as saying we're taking in the bread of life and I'm going to put in the bread of life in my life and I will be bread for others as I live out my life. So make sure you get your bread. So we're going to read the book of Matthew because it's so much about the Old Testament, the New Testament, and magnified Messiah. We're going to read Galatians because it deals with the relationship between Christian Jews and Christian Gentiles. Justification comes by faith in Jesus Christ, not by works under the law. Because you belong to him, the fruit of the Spirit should be evident in your life. So here's what I want you to do. This has been our custom. This is where we are right now. Everybody listen very carefully as you get the bread. Our society right now, and your kids and you as well, adults, will spend hours going Or we'll sit in front of the TV set for a couple of hours and watch it. We're nothing wrong with any of that. But if that's all you do, you're being indoctrinated in something lesser than who you are. We have to have a different perspective, and the perspective is the Word of God. And if you're a follower of Jesus, you have to have the Word of God. You have to have to you have something to go to when you're hit with attacks from the enemy or just natural life. You have to have something that you stand on that's beyond the natural impact of life. Something bigger than you and you find it in the Word. And what's going to happen is this. As you take time away from your TV time and as you take time away from your scrolling or, you know, just going, oh, TikTok, that's a, oh, what, a oh, what is that? A, really, is that a bunny? What, oh my God. and start pouring into the Word, this is what's going to happen. Next week, as you're studying the Word of God, and specifically what I've shared with you today is prophetic. I believe there's a reason for it. And you study Matthew, and you study Galatians. What's going to happen is you're going to face something by Wednesday somewhere that you're going to need the Word, and you're going to have read something that will be perfectly adapted to what you need to have to say. You'll get it someplace, and it'll be from your reading. And you'll go, I know what to say because you're pouring into your spirit because you're about ready to face trials of many kind, like the Bible says, and now you have resource beyond emotion, beyond circumstance, beyond stuff, beyond my past. Now you go, this is what the Word of God says. I belong to Him. That's unshakable. He sees me complete. And then all of a sudden, when, att when the attack comes from the enemy, you'll, a verse will come up of what you just read to meet the attack. This is normal life, church. And in the last days, there's a numbing, a dumbing down of people not walking by the Spirit. It's part of what's happening in the world today. And we're going to be different. We're going to pour in. So if we really are in it and not of it, the only way that's possible is if you have something in you. What you have in you is His Word.